Hey. Thank you very much and welcome, Stellark. This is great. We can have a chat together. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. So let's start by some of these intriguing artworks that are behind me, and we can flash these on the screen later, like your amazing uh, third hand. I find this, a, 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 aesthetically a beautiful piece of work to look at, but it's the concepts behind it that are really intriguing. Why don't you tell us a bit about this project and what led you to, to create this? Yeah, that was the first uh, idea of augmenting uh, the, the body. Um, I'd done a series of sensory deprivation and physically difficult projects and there was really a desire having realised the kind of limitations of the human body, how inadequate it was in the technological terrain that we now inhabit. Um, and I was wondering, you know, also having an interest in comparative uh, anatomies, um, you know, the idea of maybe augmenting the body um, uh, with technology. Um, so the idea of a third hand, an extra hand. Um, this project began in 1976, uh, but it took four years to complete. I started performing with it in 1980. And, you know, at the time, uh, sophisticated enough uh, to get the attention of the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston to demonstrate the hand to the extravehicular activity group. And why they were interested uh, was that it was an EMG controlled hand. In, in other words, actuated by the electrical signals from your muscles. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and because I wanted the three hands to have independent movements, independent capabilities, I decided on using the abdominal and leg muscles mm, yeah. to actuate um, the movements of the third hand. It's only got three degrees of freedom, yeah. a pinch release, a grasp release, um, a wrist rotation clockwise and anti-clockwise, but uh, for its time it also had a tactile feedback system mm. for a rudimentary sense of touch. Okay. Um, and so this was attached to my right uh, arm as an additional um, mechanism. And I believe there's a very famous uh, photo of you writing the word evolution using this third <laughs> hand, and the hand itself can actually be part of that writing process while you're writing with your other yeah, two it was, hands. <laughs> uh, it, it was a difficult one to do and uh, a really tedious one to to realise, but um, because of the spacing of the three hands, you had to remember that you were writing every third letter um, simultaneously. Okay. Uh, and because each letter was a different complexity, for example, an E as opposed to an I, I had to try to vary the speed of writing that each hand was producing. And because that performance happened on a sheet of glass between the artist and the audience, yeah. I also had to learn to write it back to front. <laughs> wow. Well, it was quite an achievement. And, and it leads me to, you know, think about evolution and the hand, you know, this, this hand, this thing that defines us as a human. You know, I, I keep thinking of the Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo's hand of Adam touching the hand of God and that the hand is one of the things that is so essentially human that, you know, defines the ability for us to make things like art or make things like machines. And yet as a paleontologist, we recently, uh, some colleagues and I working with fossils from Canada, found a fossil fish that was 380 million years old. It's called Elpistostegi, which in, in Latin translates to hopeful skull roof, because they thought it was a missing link, if you like, between fishes in the water and land animals on land. And when we put this, again, using, like you, we like to use high technology with, with old things like fossils. So we put this nearly two meter long fossil fish through a synchrotron and we're able to analyze the bones still in the rock inside that fin. And we identified for the first time that there were bones called digit bones or equivalent to the phalangeal bones of your hand present in fish. So we're able to push back the origin of that pattern forming a hand back to fish in water as it was previously thought to wow. be all land animals only have hands. So yeah. I find hands are a fascinating, really fascinating thing. So, so what did you find about 
with your third hand, moving it with muscles of your leg. How, how did that feel? <laughs> well, well, initially you kind of had to think, um, I want a particular function to occur with the, the hand. Yeah. Um, then you had to kind of contract that particular muscle uh, and then that would switch on the, the motor which actuated the, the worm screw and link mechanism and produce the closing motion or the rotation motion. But, you know, after several months of practice, it became really intuitive and you didn't have to sort of consciously uh, think it anymore, you know. Um, you would look literally look at the hand and it would do what you were intending to do. Yeah. Um, and also it didn't involve any discernible external movements of your body you know you you could elicit the appropriate electrical signal by you know internally contracting the muscle and um, this this involved uh, really um, little little practice uh, yeah, yeah. to achieve you know several months of of using the third hand and originally it was going to be a a permanent attachment to my body in other words I would wear it every day I would wear my clothing every day yeah. um, fortunately because the original idea was to make it out of carbon fiber um, uh, it, 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 it was just too expensive at the time um, to, to make all the components out of carbon fiber so I had to make them out of things that I could work with you know filing stainless steel and aluminium and and stuff like that and, and moulding acrylic, um, vacuum forming acrylic. So in the end, the object became heavier than I intended. Yeah. And also um, because at that time we were using uh, wet electrodes, in other words, you had to um, use some gel with the electrode. Yeah. Um, after a few days, that uh, generated skin ir irritation. Mm. So um, it began to, to be very, very uncomfortable to wear, not only because of the weight, but because of the skin irritation. So um, it really was only used for performances and, and uh, some of my presentations when I demonstrated it. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. It raises the whole concept about when we think of evolution, we've got, you know, two arms and two legs, but why don't we have a third hand? You know, has yeah. any, any creature ever evolved with an extra pair of hands or yeah. legs? Well, we know insects, of course, have multiple pairs of legs, you know, yes. six in an insect or eight in a spider. But the vertebrate, the backboned animal body plan started with paired fins at the front, which call pectoral fins in fish, which are now your arms, and paired pelvic fins, which are now your legs. But we recently found a fish um, that had ancient paired genital organs or claspers that were made of bone. And we realized after studying the patterns of how these bones formed, that these developed as what we called an orthologue or an extra genetically modified pair of limbs. So the very basic pattern in these ancient fishes was to have three paired limbs, but the third pair being uh, genital organs that in the males were these bony claspers, but in the females yeah. were an extra set of bones inside the, inside the hip area. So, but again, we lost these through evolution as eventually the bone was lost and the genital organs that were paired primitively, like they still are in many snakes and lizards and amphibians, then merged into one for the mammalian and, and advanced reptilian condition. So again, when no, I look, look at your art, it conjures up all these amazing stories of evolution for me, and that's something I think everyone can, can learn from. Well, with the with the extended arm, uh, which which is the the other object in the in the exhibition, um, that was that was um, a, a, a whole arm that you wore, mm -hmm. so it extended yeah. your arm in fact to primate proportions. <laughs> so a bit retro, it yeah. added an additional joint. So instead of only having three joints, you had four joints, yeah. and. Um, as well as uh, wrist rotation, you ha had thumb rotation yep. and individual finger flexion. But what's novel about the extended arm is that the fingers could split open. So the fingers 
become a gripper in itself. So technically each finger could be a gripper. Wow. <laughs> well, that, that goes back to um, arthropods and crabs and things that have, you know, pincher type, type uh, you know, claws and things. But the other thing it, that raises is that these arms, like your extendable arm, have these thick plates of metal on the outside with, with the soft arm of you, your arm, on the inside. And that also brings up an evolutionary comparison for me because one of the first groups of ancient fishes I studied as a student when I was in Melbourne at Monash University was a group called placoderms, which comes from the Greek, as you probably know, plakos meaning plate and dermos meaning skin. And there were plates in the skin that formed an armour around these early fish. And one really peculiar fish, and it's called Bothrylepis, had bony arms with plates of bone on the outside with all the muscle on the inside. It's like the total reverse of, of our arm where the bones are on the inside and the muscles are over the bone. So again, that, that harkens back to what you've created is a primeval archaic body plan that most people don't even know about, but it's embedded in your artwork. And I think that's absolutely stupendous. It's great stuff. Well, and, and what's kind of ironic in a way is that um uh, for example, with the exoskeleton arm, which yeah. was used for the rewired performance, um, uh, that was necessary uh, for people online to remotely access my right arm and remotely animate it. Wow, that so would have been exciting. It was, it was actually <laughs> a kind of uh, uh, a means by which you could share your agency with people in other places. And actually for the rewired performance, um, for five days, six hours every day, I yeah. could only see with the eyes of someone in London. I could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, but anyone anywhere could access my right arm yeah. to, uh, to to animate it. So, so the kind of exoskeleton, that outer skeleton was necessary for this um, very contemporary and, and, and uh, sort of virtual operation of online interfacing a human body in one location with a human body elsewhere. Wow. <laughs> and were people kind to you with this external <laughs> control of your arm? What were some of the things uh, that happened? <laughs> um, well, uh, on an average, um, every day, we had about 300 gallery visitors and the gallery visitors could interact with the arm with a large touch screen. So by touching the 3D model on the screen, uh, they could insert their choreography into my arm immediately. Uh, people online had to be queued up yeah. uh, of necessity. Uh, but um, th this was this was kind of an interesting experience because there were about 300 people uh, daily going through the gallery, yeah. but uh, over a thousand people online. So effectively, we had about 1,300 um, interactions with my arm uh, daily uh, for those six days of the performance, and yeah, it got fatiguing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 you know, part of the performance artist thing that you do is that consciousness, the experience of what you do, you're feeling something that no one else can ever experience. And, and how you translate that to, to us as, as, as your audience or your followers is always important. And um, one of the other pieces here, speaking of arms, is the work you did, there's a photo behind me and we'll flash this on the screen later, of the, the, uh, your arm with, a, with an ear, the ear <laughs> on arm surgery. So tell us a bit about that and what, what motivated you to do that. Yeah, well, it was I having having sort of engineered a third hand and an extended arm, and having performed on a six-legged walking robot. I, I was always using these these kind of hard technologies, you know, metal, uh, stainless steel, uh, electronic circuitry, and, and I always had a desire to to create a a soft prosthesis, yes, uh, one that would be a permanent part of my body yeah. and the idea actually 
began in around 1996 when I was at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I was doing a, I, I, I did some work with um, uh, 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 growing some muscle cells. Yeah. And, and, and at the time, I, I didn't imagine that I would put them on a pedestal and on a plinth and, and, and exhibit them as an artwork. But I was sort of interested in, 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 the, in the general interdisciplinarity that occurred um, at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. At Carnegie Mellon University, I think it's still active, yeah. um, and they were experimenting with biology and robotics, and and so I, I did this project, and I, I guess from that time I had a desire to construct a, a soft prosthesis, but it took ten years. Wow! <laughs> and, Why did um, it take so long? Uh, it took ten years to find three surgeons yeah. uh, to assist with the project, and also to get funding. Um, from a London production company that was doing a, a, a documentary on experimental medical surgeries. I see. And initially they wanted me to, to uh, provide them um, the video of the stomach sculpture. I made a, I did a project where I um, designed a sculpture for the inside of my body, oh, yeah. uh, the inside of my stomach. And um uh, uh, with the help of a friendly endoscopist, <laughs> we we inflated the stomach and then inserted this object, which was a capsule structure about yeah. the size of my thumb. But when it was inside the stomach, it could open and close, extend and retract, had a flashing light and a beeping sound <laughs> Amazing. Uh, the size of a small fist. Yeah. So the idea was actually to fill the volume of the stomach uh, with, this, uh, with this simple robotic object. Yeah. And, um, uh, but but I, 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 said, I sort of argued with them that this was a previous project and, and wouldn't it be good if they could fund uh, the completion of an idea of constructing an ear on my arm. And we went to several television stations to, to kind of try to get them interested, but eventually um, Discovery US uh, funded the project. Fantastic, and I believe this ear, um, I read the story that obviously only lasted a short time because you did develop an infection, but while it was active, it also had a, a mechanism for hearing um, and translating that sound somewhere else, is that correct? Well, I don't oh, know there if it you've is. seen it. <laughs> you still got it. <laughs> How, that's amazing. Yeah, it's probably difficult to see it in the light. We can see the uh, outline, it's definitely an ear. <laughs> Um, so, so it begs the question from an evolutionary biology perspective of why don't we have ears on our arms? Why do we only have ears on our heads? Why, you know, like the amazing creatures from Terra del Toros' movie Pan's Labyrinth, the, the pale man that has the eyes in the middle of his hands, you know, chasing the children to eat them. Why don't we have eyes in our hands? Why don't we have ears on our arms? And it's because evolution is unlike us as creative humans, is constrained by laws. Um, you know, the sensory organs all developed around close to the brain because they could transmit the signals quickly. So ears, eyes and smell are all in our heads. But many creatures have um, sensory systems that, that can extend all through their bodies, like, like a clam or a, or a mussel can have a series of eyes around the lip of the shell you know, sensing its, its light. Um, but, but ears are particularly interesting because, you know, a sense of hearing has to relate to um, the brain, you know, carry that signal to the brain. But I, I worked on a fossil fish once. We found this amazing fish at Gogo -Go in the Kimberley where we get these ancient fish that are nearly 400 million years old, but they're not squashed flat like kippers on a rock. They're three-dimensional and perfect. And we actually... Yeah etch them out slowly using weak acetic acid so we get a three-dimensional skeleton. And in this fish, which in 1985, when I was just a, a humble PhD, I just finished my PhD, I discovered a snout in the collections at the ANU, just a tiny little snout of a fish, and I called it gogonasus, meaning snout from gogo. 
And later on, in 1986, I mounted an expedition to this site and I found the whole complete skull of this fish. But part of it was damaged and we still didn't know the complete you know, structure of this head. But in 2005, when I was um, working at, at Museum Victoria in Melbourne, we found a whole complete skull, a perfect head, a whole body of this fish. And you know what? It had a hole, a pair of holes on top of its head. And at first we didn't know what these were. So it led us to investigate some living fishes. And there's a fish called Polypterus, or the African reed fish, that also has these holes on top of its head that open and close when it breathes. This is amazing. So these holes on top of the head go to canals that link to the back of the throat so they can gulp in air to a, to a set of lungs inside the body. So it made us think that these ancient fish had the holes on the head for breathing air. But where I'm going with this is all about hearing because the amazing thing is that this hole on the head that was used for breathing eventually became the eustachian tube that's now in your ear. So it connects the outside of the skull to the inside mechanism where we have the incus, hammer and malleus bones, these three tiny little bones. But in my fish, those bones were not bones of the inner ear. They were bones of the upper and lower jaw and a bone that connected the jaw to the skull or the inner skull, the brain case. So we have this amazing story in evolution where hearing sort of devolved, evolved as a byproduct of breathing, which we would never think of in a million years, yeah. but, but we've got the, yeah. the chain of evidence, if you like. And, you know, yeah. seeing an ear on your arm it, it, or, you know, movies where they have the eyes and the hands always begs the question, why didn't we evolve those structures? And of course, there's always a logical reason because we want to maximize the sensory outputs of those structures. But, but tell me, with and actually, yeah, yeah, actually, your your mention of the of the uh, eye in the hand, yeah. um, there 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 are in fact good reasons in robotics uh, to have an eye in hand manipulator yeah. uh, because if you're uh, trying to to uh, uh, grasp or, or manipulate very very small objects, the eyes in your head, uh, you know, are not going to be able to see, uh, you know, uh, through your your hand that's blocking what your fingers are doing. Um, so, in fact, the ambidextrous um, uh, arm, which was uh, a project that I initiated at University of um, and I believe it's still a research project there. Yeah. Uh, the idea there was a double jointed hand and arm. Yeah. So imagine if all the fingers can bend one way yeah. and the thumb can rotate, you've got a, a right hand, but the fingers can bend completely the other way, the thumb can rotate backwards, you've got a left hand and a right hand all in one. Yes. Um, so e even in a prosthesis, I mean, if you're an amputee, why replace your lost right hand uh, with another right hand when you could replace it with an ambidextrous hand? Yeah. Two, two left hands might be better able to perform a task <laughs> yeah, than yeah. a left hand and a right hand in certain circumstances. But to have a, an eye in hand um, yeah. in the ambidextrous arm, uh, the idea was that you would have this sort of disembodied eye that you could direct uh, behind you, you could direct... Um, uh, and inspect uh, things in cavities. Um, so, you know, there are, although I guess evolution has made us very specialised creatures, yes, depending yeah. on our particular environments, and we've lost some of the evolutionary um, kind of innovations in a way that, that earlier creatures might have yeah. had. Um, you know, it's good to sort of uh, revisit some of those and, and perhaps, um, you know, and in robotics, biomimicry is, is quite a common approach now where you study insects and animals and, and try to emulate them uh, with uh, robotic uh, grippers. Yeah, that, it is fascinating. It's at, uh, you know, the whole evolution of things like, like hands and, you know, the very first terrestrial animals or uh, what we call tetrapods, animals that have four limbs, you know, two arms, two legs. They had 
varying numbers of fingers, you know, like some of them had six, some of them had seven, some of them had eight digits because they were experimenting which, which combination would work the best. And then the moment they left the water and were able to, to walk on land, five fingers and five toes become set in evolution. And the only time we've ever varied from that is, as you say, where we come overly specialized and we actually lose hands or we lose limbs and snakes are a classic example because yeah. um you know snakes can do amazing things as we were chatting about this before that you know they have the amazing dexterity of their body but do you know we have fossil snakes that date back to the age of dinosaurs where they have tiny little limbs tiny little legs and arms and eventually they lose that and then they become fully capable of burrowing and and you know pushing their their head into the sand or, or doing amazing things with their jaws. So they become even more specialised by losing hands, yes. you know. Yeah. And when you look at a, at a snake, um, a single cord that uh, can do sinusoidal horizontal movement and yeah. it can wrap itself around something, but then also you look at an elephant's trunk yes. that can yes. wrap itself and lift something. And so you, you, you can imagine... Um, a novel, a novel endoscope that is completely uh, flexible and, and endoscopes now uh, can uh, kind of uh, be manipulated in 3D space. Yep. Um, then you can see how some of these uh, more specialised functions can lead to uh, really novel uh, mechanisms that... Uh, so so uh, a simple creature like a snake can be a sophisticated endoscope. Yeah, uh, indeed. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I'm looking at this work behind me. You've got this work called Parasite, Event for Invaded and Involuntary Body. So, so tell me a bit about that, and then I want to talk a bit about parasites in nature. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in a very different sense, uh, obviously, but uh, parasite performance was a performance where um, we, we customised the search engine uh, that scanned the internet, selected anatomical images of the body, uh, showed them in my head-up display. Those images were analysed and depending on the complexity of that image, that would determine the complexity of my body's movements. So this was a, a computer-connected uh, muscle stimulation system. Um, so the body moves involuntarily yeah. um, by the images. So the images that it sees yeah. are the images that move, uh, move the body. Uh, so the body becomes, in a sense, parasitic to... Uh, this internet search engine yeah. um, and um, uh, the, 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 the other technologies required uh, to generate this, this, this particular performance. Fascinating. Um, you know, the, the word parasite always conjures like squeamish, creepy crawly feelings in people because we think of them as creatures that, that latch onto us, that feed on our blood or, you know, but, but most human bodies carry thousands of other organisms around on them at any one stage. We have little mites that eat our dead skin and things like that. We have creatures inside our body that are bacteria and things that are symbiotic with us. You know, symbiosis means something can live in harmony with something else but still draw a living, if you like, from the, the fluids and energy of, of that living organism. Whereas a parasite draws its energy from the living host it wants to keep the host alive because it doesn't want to leave, lose its meal ticket, so to speak. So, yes. you know, the, the parasites can actually kill their host if there's too many of them. Do you yeah. think your, your parasite could have been a danger to the human host eventually? <laughs> um, no, it got, it got awfully fatiguing again yeah. when, when um, this sort of these internet images were... were, were were generating all of these involuntary uh, movements in my arms and legs, um, but but also the the name also played on 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 <clears throat> the idea of you know para uh, parasite as in paranormal, ah, yes, um, yes. you know uh, a, a, as a site where something 
other is possible. Right. Um, yep. and, and, and also uh, the word symbiosis is, is a good one to use in this, where, where the body is part of this extended operational system of internet search engine, um, uh, host computers, satellites, um, you know, people in other places and so on. Yep. Um, so you have this, this system that's dependent on, on each other, uh, that's parasitic on each other, uh, that really can't function effectively uh, without these other things coming into play. So it, w it was that kind of uh, situation that, you know, a lot of these performances set up, not seeing uh, the human in any hierarchical sense, yep. but functioning in a kind of flattened ontology where a, a body, a machine, a microbe, uh, an algorithm yep. are all equally uh, uh, functional and interactive. Yeah, yeah. And in nature, everything's equal, whether you're a, bi a bacteria, a virus, or a human yeah. being. It doesn't matter. Uh, things function in their own umwelt, their own, the world that they perceive is different, yes. you know. Um, I, I love the the interaction between scientists and artists is always a fascinating thing for me. Um, some years ago, I knew the the team over in we University of West Australia, Iona, Iona Katz, and and those guys, oh, yes. and and the work they were doing, growing tissue cultures as as art. And I recently examined a, a PhD from one of their students, which was all about the umwelt of the lungfish. You know, how does an animal perceive a world? And, and your art in, in some way brings you back to perception, how you perceive the world when you're not a normal human being, you're a human that's augmented. Um, tell us about the way you feel or some of the experiences you might have had with these various performance art um, prosthetics over the years. Did, did you ever feel like you were reaching a heightened level of consciousness, for example? Oh, I wouldn't describe it in that way, but I, I, I guess um, the premise of all of these projects was that by altering the architecture of the body, by experimenting um, with additional limbs or additional sensors, uh, you might adjust the awareness that you have in the world. Okay. And I mean, this is in a very... It's more of an aesthetic gesture than, than a kind of scientific experiment. Yeah. Uh, but with all of these ideas, what's important is to actualize them in some way, to experience, the, uh, to experience them at least personally and thereby have something meaningful to articulate afterwards. Um, but having said that, I've always been sceptical of trying to report subjective experience ah yes of um, course and and i think um the best way that i i've described these performances is that they're being done uh, with a posture of indifference okay. and by indifference i mean as opposed to having expectations so you allow the performance to unfold in its own way you know, with its own rhythm in its own time um rather than to quickly collapse the possibilities that might occur through having too many expectations. Um, so you, you try to uh, experience these with little or no um, uh, sort of prejudices as to how you're going to perceive them. Yeah, no preconceived notion of what it might lead to. So, I mean, the world of science and art to some people seems a big divide, but to you and I it isn't really because you work with engineers and computer scientists and in effect you're a, you're a kind of scientist who's doing art. Whereas we scientists that look at look at the human body and look at look at the evolution of the human body, I mean, it's just two spectrums of what it means to be human, isn't it? One is that we can study the the anatomy and the and the structures and the evolution, and the other is to study the the experiences and the the feelings of what it's like to be human. Is that is that what you would you would? What, what's it mean to some of the, these experiences that you've done? How does that affect your definition of what it means to be human? You know, I, I think that's that's a pretty good um, 
summary, really. I mean, if, if in consciousness studies, we do focus on qualia, <laughs> uh, then what you're 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 saying is 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 completely completely something to to focus on. Um, having said that, um, I, I think we should understand that you know the methodologies uh, in science and 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 the practice of art uh, are, are two very different uh, approaches to the world. Yeah. Um, we certainly collaborate. Uh, we certainly um, produce unexpected outcomes through our discussions and our uh, and 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 our uh, interactions. On the other hand, we don't want to mush the two things together. Um, we don't want to have artists doing bad research and yeah. scientists making bad art. <laughs> oh, we al we already do that on our side. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but but. Uh, you know, having having um, used technology, um, medical imaging, prosthetics yep. and robotics, and virtual reality systems from the very beginning, I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not expressing a scepticism, but rather a more tentative approach to these collaborations, where we both understand where we're coming from. And you know how how can we develop a, a common language? Because yeah. if you're a quantum physicist and you're talking to an artist, or you're an artist talking about postmodernism to a quantum physicist, it, it you know you you can only communicate in the most general uh, uh, ways. And yeah. I was once on a on a panel with Sir Roger Penrose, oh, yes. and. Um, you know, his idea of contemporary art was impressionism, perhaps mm. post-impressionism. Yeah. Um, he didn't really understand why someone at the time was wanting an ear on his arm. At the time, I hadn't actually realised it. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, so that's, a, I think, a problem, how to develop a common language yeah. that's meaningful enough to be able to communicate at levels of intelligibility that, mm. you know, are meaningful to you and to me. Um, I think it's a little easier in our in our areas of research. Yeah. Um, but uh, in 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 mathematics, in um, sometimes in in engineering, uh, and certainly in quantum physics uh, physics then it becomes a little bit more difficult. It does. I mean, even a, a quantum physicist, I couldn't understand half of what they say. I'm a scientist with a PhD in a very specific field, you know, paleontology. So I have my own jargon that I'm, I'm familiar with to talk with my colleagues. But you're right, when we express our feelings, our experiences as a form of knowledge, that's really what art is, isn't it? It's like it is a new form of knowledge, or an old form of knowledge, I should say. It's older than science, way older. But it's a way of experiencing the world uh, as an individual, and you're communicating it to the rest of us through your amazing work. You know, I think the word alter alternative is, is a good one to use. It's an alternative way yes. of, of perceiving it, of experiencing the world, as is science, yep. um, you know, as is philosophy, really. Yeah, um, yeah, they're all knowledge so, systems. Um, yeah. Now, this brings me to staring at me across the wall, which you can't see, is a picture of you suspended, surrounded by rocks, and you're hanging by meat hooks. Now, there's, and you've done several of these suspension artworks over the years, and it's fascinating to see each one of them, the different durations, the different backgrounds, the different kinds of things you were trying to, to, to bring across to people. Why did you do these suspensions and what got you into those in the first place? Um, yeah, well, I'd done this series of sensory deprivation and physically difficult actions. So, for example, the, the, the performance uh, to the first suspension uh, event uh, was a performance where I stitched my lips and eyelids shut with surgical needle and thread. Um, I was tethered to the gallery wall mm. with two hooks into the skin of my back and I stayed there for one week 
I couldn't eat, I couldn't oh. drink, I couldn't speak, I couldn't see, I mm. could hear, yeah. um, and I could smell. Um, but uh, it, it was part of this series of explorations on the physical and psychological limitations of the body. Yes. And, how- uh, and also at the same time, I made three films of the inside of my body. I made, uh, using endoscopic technology at the time, uh, three metres of internal space into the lungs, left and right bronchi of the lungs, uh, into my stomach and, and into the colon. And um, so, so it was really exploring the parameters, uh, the physical uh, uh, limitations of the body. And then uh, I, I had done a series of performances where I suspended my body with uh, harnesses. Yeah. And the body looked more supported than suspended. Yes. Uh, and, and then when I was f- flicking through a book on Hindu Indian rituals and piercings, mm, I yeah. thought, well, gosh, if I could suspend my body in this way, I could, with a minimal um, support structure, in fact, the skin itself would uh, be the support for the body, uh, the body's uh, weight, Um, then this would be a much more elegant way of suspending the body instead of supporting it in a harness. Hmm. So I I did a a performance where I suspended my body uh, horizontally, uh, face down, yep. um, 18 hooks into my back. No. Uh, they were actually fish hooks that were uh, sharpened. Uh, there was a funny story because yeah. um, I, I, I purchased, uh, I did a series of 27 suspensions yeah. in Jap- whilst I was living in Japan and I would go back to the same uh, fish shop to buy these uh, large shark hooks <laughs> yeah. uh, that I would file the barbs off. Yeah. And after several uh, visits to the same uh, fishing uh, store, they thought I was some big game fisherman because I would always buy the largest uh, fish hooks yeah. and, and I would point to them and they would go, aha, I saw this guy, big fish. <laughs> oh, and I would nod in agreement. Yeah. Um, but the image that you were referring to was in fact uh, – a performance where the body is counterbalanced by a ring of rocks. Yes, I'm looking uh, at that one right rock. Now. Yeah, one rock uh, for each um, insertion point. Hmm. And in fact, the body was gently swaying from side to side, setting up random oscillations in the rocks. Amazing. So it wasn't a totally static suspension. And this performance began when the body was hoisted up, but uh, it ended when the telephone rang in the gallery. No, oh, no. <laughs> so the, the first question that comes to my mind is how did you manage the pain? What did you feel? Um, well, well, I decided when I was, do, do, you know, because I, I was doing these incrementally more and more difficult projects yeah. and, you know, to stitch my eyelids and lips shut with surgical needle and thread on my own was oh, pretty yeah. daunting. I, you know... I consulted a, a doctor friend, but he, he was only reluctantly advising me. Um, and, and so, you know, you have to remember this was incremental. Yep. Uh, but I also decided that if I was going to do this, that I, I would not use any anesthetic, um, yep. that I had to be fully aware. I mean, pain is an early alert warning system that mm. something is happening, something's wrong. Yep. Uh, you should stop doing it or you should yeah. focus on what's happening. Yeah. It's, this is not natural um, is what it's telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the, the different suspension performances were in uh, different positions like uh, 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 suspended obliquely, upside down. Um, uh, I was suspended very high, uh, 60 metres high above the Royal Theatre in in, in Copenhagen mm. and that was interesting because after about 30 metres yeah. I could only hear the whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors and the creaking of the skin. Oh, <laughs> gee, yeah. So you, you must have 
your body must just switch off, does it? The pain, you you become comfortable with it, or 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 you just somehow don't react to the signal of pain. How, how did you? Yeah, I do mean, it? it's very difficult to describe, but um, I don't think there's any numbing that occurs. Mm. Uh, but of course, what happens is. You know, the initial insertions, uh, obviously the first sort of indications of a painful experience. And then when your body is hoisted off the ground, uh, then it's taking its full weight. And then that's another level of of difficulty. Um, So, and then if you're moving in that performance, my body was also spinning. Um, You know, so, so you have these different levels of 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 painful experience yeah. uh, that you that you overcome and then you put up with yeah that well it doesn't I, go away <laughs> well it's amazing that you've done these these suspension works and they're, they're so provocative they make you really think about what it is to be human and and pain how pain defines people um you know the evolution of pain is an interesting thing because you know we have these different kinds of pain. We have noce receptors that, you know, is pain that if you break a finger, it signals to the body that the pain that's happening in your head is really tells you it's in your finger. So you know something's wrong, you know, with your hand. But there's also neuropathic pain where the nervous system itself is not functioning. And you can imagine you've got pain in different parts of your body that there may not be pain. So pain is something that seems to define vertebrates, backboned animals, as this, this unique pain system to tell us there's something wrong and to let us survive better you know pain's all about survival if we didn't have pain we wouldn't be able to know something was wrong and fix it before that pain becomes infected and might might kill you you know so it's um yeah. it's an interesting thing that is is important part of evolution it prompts me um to uh, reminds me of um wittgenstein the philosopher wittgenstein yes. um who said that or who asserted that you're not necessarily in the best position to evaluate your own pain. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, uh, you know, um, you might have a pain in your neck, but it might may be emanating from a, a, a pinched nerve halfway down your spine, for example. Exactly. Um, so, um, I mean, he was asserting this for, for other reasons, um, uh, especially with his notion of language games and... Yeah. And, and how we, we kind of, um, in a sense, define the world through, through language, the way that we use words. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, yes, no, that's, that's what you reminded me of when you were describing uh, the evolutionary reasons for pain. Yeah. So talking about language, um, an artist not only creates these amazing works that you then put into performance, but you have to create a narrative or a dialogue around it. Um, do you struggle or do you work, how do you create the right language around the, the, the works you create? Is that something you, you take a lot of time over? Yeah, no, that's an, it's an interesting one because obviously, in, uh, you know, we, we have a cultural continuity. Um, we're immersed in our various uh, researches historically yeah. Um, you know, uh, as an artist, there's a certain context within which these projects and performances are, are kind of realised and, uh, who, you know, whose ideas first originate. So there is that contextualised um, uh, uh, positioning uh, in, in the arts as in, as in other areas. I, I think uh, it reminds me also of a, of a Japanese artist, Goji Hamada, uh, who is a, also a performance artist that I, I got to know very well. And uh, Goji always spoke about art as a soft language, okay. yeah. as opposed to the kind of uh, literal kind yeah. of hard language, hard language of, yeah. of, of, of our grammar, of our... Of our um, a spoken uh, yeah. communication and and you know a soft language that's that's more intuitive 
uh, more ambivalent that doesn't necessarily provide a, a clear narrative. Hmm. I mean, language on the one hand uh, enables us to comprehend the world by categorising the world, by naming parts of the world, but yeah. also language uh, uh, can also confuse us philosophically. Yeah. So, um, you know, the word mind hmm. does not necessarily mean that we have some sort of intrinsic essence inside of our brain yes. that is a mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating because in science, we, we write these very turgid scientific papers, you know, that's all about the, the prose and the language, the jargon of, of, of deep science. And if we, we don't like what we've done, it's open to criticism. It's often open to peer review. We might even go back and rewrite that paper or republish something else and then again down the track if we think we've made a mistake or we want to correct something. Do you ever go back and think, well, some of those earlier installations or earlier <laughs> works I've done, I'd like to do better or I could, I could redo <laughs> them and, and, and have a different experience of them or would you like to write about those experiences or something, you know, to, to, to no, re I mean, relive that's, them? That's <laughs> It's really interesting. Um, firstly, the, the third hand yeah. was never completed. Okay. Um, yeah. For example, when you see the, when you see the acrylic uh, 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 a part of, a part of the, the hand that, that holds the mechanism yeah. uh, together, uh, there's a lot of empty space in that. And uh, that empty space was meant to house another motor, oh, yeah. another gearing system, that would actually rotate the hand around the arm. So as well as having wrist rotation, the third hand would have rotated around the arm as well. Amazing. So it would have added an additional capability, uh, yeah. which was very disappointing at the time, but I ran out of money because this was self-funded. Yeah. I, I was keen to start performing with it. And so, you know, I've made a career out of being a failure. Nothing that I imagine has turned out the way that it actually has. That's so nothing, you know, and yeah. I think we have to imagine art in a slightly different way, you know, that I think what's interesting about art is the slippage that occurs between the artist's intention yeah. and the actual outcome. Yeah. That's so... Amazing. You don't really begin with a kind of blueprint yeah. or a set of experimental parameters yeah. that you then kind of follow through methodically and often reductively. Um, you begin in a much more sort of open-ended way um, and, and uh, you, you explore things in, in a, in a, with a different you know, with a different mindset, really. Yeah, yeah. And in, in a way, that's art is a lot like science in that respect. People think we're all clinical in our white lab coats with an experiment that must have a certain result. But science is built on failure. You know, the best scientists made mistakes, and from those mistakes, they learnt not what to do next. And eventually, it led them to make some big breakthroughs that, you know, some of the biggest discoveries. Um, and, you know, science and art are not too dissimilar in that sense that we have to learn from failure. And also, but we have to also record honestly uh, our experiences. And, yeah, you know, and there's, a, there's a conceptual continuity in, in your research or your your interests and in mine, uh, but f for this artist, those, uh, those interests are not uh, performed as a kind of iteration for a better and better uh, outcome, uh, but rather as an iteration that uh, generates more and more unexpected and possibilities. So iteration in mathematics is more, you know, a sy systematic uh, kind of uh, improvement from one mathematical operation to another until you end up with a more successful uh, uh, solution. Uh, that's not really the kind of uh, mindset of 
of, of, of arts practice. Yeah. Well, look, I think we have to wrap up now. So, look, it's been a, <laughs> a fascinating hour speaking to you and I've enjoyed myself immensely. So, and again, thank you for this wonderful exhibition that you've put on here at Flinders and for your whole lifetime's contribution to art and understanding the human condition. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John, for all your feedback and, and uh, I really enjoyed speaking to you at the opening. So thank you very much.